out there, you're watching Imo Hasanovic from Indian River State College uh, covering lecture number seven of uh, fiber optics video series. The topic of our, our uh, today's lecture is going to be fiber optic measurements. We are going to cover a few important aspects of uh, measurements performed in the field of uh, fiber optic communications. We will describe the value of conducting accurate test measurements. We are also going to uh, see various types of testing that's being performed in the area of fiber optic communications. We will elaborate on the importance and the meaning of maximum allowable loss. And then we'll move to uh, the understanding of the various methods of optical loss test measurements uh, performed using optical loss test set or so-called OLTS. We'll see what, are, uh, what, what do we mean by uh, measurement quality jumpers and uh, uh, launch cables and how they are being used in fiber optic measurements. An important topic that's also going to be covered is the uh, optical time domain reflectometer or so uh, uh, called uh, OTDR and the way how it's being used in fiber optic measurements and finally value of keeping fiber optic records. Before we dive into the whole area of uh, measurements performed in fiber optic communications, we first want to define optical fiber loss and what types of fiber optic loss we may encounter in the area of fiber optic communications. So if you look ideally, optical signals coupled between the fiber optic components are transmitted with no loss of light. The whole idea of a fiber optic link is to take uh, information embedded into the light and then let light propagate along the optical fiber from uh, transmitting side to the receiving side and then uh, to fi figure out some sort of way to uh, take a, a signal, a light signal and uh, transform it to the electrical signal and finally uh, extract the, uh, the information that's been sent uh, embedded in that signal. So the goal is to uh, have a minimum loss and ideally there will be no loss, however, if you're talking about real case scenario, there's always a certain amount of loss. In other words, the signal that we are sending from the transmitting side is going to uh, be attenuated as it is being propagated along uh, an optical, optical fiber. So it's very important to minimize the loss in a system uh, so that uh, uh, we have uh, optimum performance. Uh, and uh, the, that's exactly uh, why we are focusing on uh, uh, types of losses that are present in fiber optic links. So to uh, clarify what kind of uh, losses we are talking, uh, in the case of a fiber optic link, there are basically three uh, specific types of uh, losses. One is the cable loss, uh, the loss that's being present on an on a optical fiber. We also have a connector loss, losses uh, present in the connectors uh, uh, on the fiber optic link, and finally splice losses that are a result of uh, uh, optical fibers being spliced at certain locations. On this slide, in the uh, uh, top uh, right corner, you also see a nice plot uh, that uh, uh, visually presents the way how a power budget has been uh, calculated in, uh, in an uh, optical uh, fiber. You see the transmitter on the left side and the receiver on the right side, and then you see a whole bunch of uh, connections, uh, either connectors or splices that are present along the fiber. As the signal propagates along the optical fiber, you see the, uh, that uh, the power of that signal is uh, 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 reducing. There's a downward slo slope curve shown here in green color on a plot that uh, is a, a consequence, that's an implication of the loss along the fiber. And then you also have a certain sudden drops at certain locations that can be associated with the, uh, the presence of the connectors and splices uh, along the fiber optic link. There's a certain margin that has to be established you also see a receiver sensitivity that's an important threshold. If you are below, a, uh, if uh, the strength of the signal that's been received at the, re uh, at the receiver's site is uh, lower than the receiver sensitivity, that signal will not be able to be recovered and uh, uh, that will be an unsuccessful transmission of a signal on a, fi on a specific fiber optic link. Obviously, uh, the, the level of the, of, the, of the power that's being received at the receiver is going to depend on many factors, including the loss along the optical fiber, including the power of the signal that's been transmitted from the transmitter, etc., etc. So all these different aspects are going to be, uh, uh, be discussed and uh, elaborated during this uh, lecture. Here are a few numbers that are important to uh, uh, elaborate, to put things into the perspective. 
so we want to see what is a, a standard cable law. So we are talking about multi-mode fiber. Multi-mode fiber is a type of fiber that has more, more of a loss than a single-mode fiber. So if we are talking about multi-mode fiber, we are talking about 3.5 dB per kilometer at an operational wavelength of uh, 850 nano nanometers or uh, 1.5 dB per kilometer at the operational wavelength of 1300 nanometers. Uh, if we are considering a single mode fiber, uh, we have already learned that single mode fiber uh, has a higher quality and uh, uh, the fact that you are propagating uh, one single mode would uh, result in a lower loss along that type of uh, uh, optical fiber. So uh, for a single mode fiber we are dealing with uh, about 1 dB of loss per kilometer at uh, operational wavelengths of uh, 1310, 1550 and 1625 nanometers uh, in the case of an indoor cable or half a dB per kilometer for an outdoor cable. Uh, for uh, all three single mode uh, operational wavelengths that are listed here. If we are talking about the connector loss, then the standard uh, uh, or maximum allowable law, connector loss will be 0.75 dB per minute pair. So every time you install a connector uh, and do a measurement over the connector, you want to be sure, you want to make sure that you are below this number because this is uh, the, the, the maximum allowable uh, uh, loss for a mated connector pair. And finally, if I'm talking about the splice loss, we're talking about 0.3 dB loss for both mechanical and fusion splices. So these numbers are very important. They're giving you an indication of like a reference that you uh, need to know about uh, when you are uh, doing installation uh, of a, a certain fiber optic uh, link and uh, uh, also when you are performing certain measurements. Uh, so, uh, if uh, you are within these numbers, uh, you're talking about successful of, uh, fiber optic link. If you're not, then a certain um, uh, troubleshooting and uh, a fix has to, uh, has to occur on a fiber optic link that is uh, under the consideration. It's important to mention a few important mechanisms uh, from which uh, fiber optic loss uh, stems. Um, those uh, mechanisms can be uh, categorized as internal to the optical fiber as well as external to the optical fiber. If we're talking about internal mechanisms, we're talking about so-called intrinsic attenuation or intrinsic loss that results from the materials inherent to the fiber and from the manufacturing process. So what we're talking about here are certain impurities that may exist in a, in a glass uh, that's been used to make a, a glass core of, a, of an optical fiber. So every time you have impurity, you're talking about different type material uh, the different uh, optical properties that would ultimately have an impact on the propagation of the light since the light is going to scatter or uh, reflect from uh, those impurities. In the case of uh, uh, external mechanisms, we are talking about so-called extrinsic attenuation. Uh, that is a result of a few, uh, a few mechanisms. Uh, we will uh, mention macro bending, uh, micro bending, and fin finally fiber alignment, and each of these is going to be elaborated on the slides that follow. When we are talking about optical fiber misalignment, we are basically talking about three, uh, three uh, specific uh, uh, mechanisms that uh, would result in uh, optical fiber misalignment. The first one is so-called fiber separation or longitudinal misalignment. Uh, that type of misalignment you can see here uh, on this slide on a, in a, on a uh, top on the bottom uh, right corner. So we have two fibers that are axially aligned, but there's a smaller gap or separation between the two fibers. Uh, the second type of um, misalignment would be a lateral or axial misalignment, shown here uh, on the right side, uh, uh, top uh, right side, where the two cores are misaligned axially. And finally, uh, we may also uh, deal with an angular misalignment shown here in the uh, bottom uh, left-hand corner. Where two, uh, where two optical fibers uh, are basically um, angularly misaligned, so there is certain uh, angular separation between the between the two cores of the optical fibers. Each of these uh, uh, types of misalignments would uh, result in certain in a certain uh, loss of the optical signal due to the fact that the light would have to go through uh, either an air gap or 
uh, has to uh, jump from a core into the cladding, which ultimately is going to also, as I said, result in uh, the loss of the optical power. Losses due to fiber alignment depend on the fiber type, core diameter, and the distribution of optical power among propagating modes. Uh, so there are different aspects that have to be taken into account. If you're talking about the fibers with large numerical apertures, these types of fibers would reduce loss from uh, angular misalignment and uh, on the other side increase the loss from fiber separation. So different types of uh, fibers would uh, uh, react to the uh, optical fiber misalignments in different ways. Uh, another example would be single mode fibers that are more sensitive to the alignment errors than multi-mode fibers because of their small core size, which is obvious. And finally, the last comment that we want to make is that alignment errors in multi-mode fiber connections may actually disturb the distribution of the optical power in the propagating modes, thus increasing coupling loss. So if we are dealing with the multi-mode fibers, we know that uh, in the case of multi-mode fibers, we have multiple modes that are propagating along the uh, core of the fiber, and any kind of misalignment would have a certain negative impact on uh, on uh, these different uh, modes. Uh, in other words, uh, we'll have a certain disturbance uh, of the distribution of the optical power that may eventually result in, in the loss of the signal. We have also previously mentioned uh, internal mechanisms that would uh, create the loss of the uh, signal as uh, the signal propagates along the optical fibers. Uh, we mentioned intrinsic losses that are uh, stemming from uh, certain impurities in the glass, but there's also uh, many other types of internal mechanisms that would uh, uh, result in, uh, in the loss of a uh, signal. Uh, here, if you shown on this slide, here we are talking about um, uh, certain mismatches, fiber mismatch, mismatches that are a uh, result of a manufacturer's failure to maintain optical or structural or geometrical tolerances during the fi fiber fabrication. So we are talking about fiber geometry mismatches, numerical aperture mismatch, refractive index profile difference, etc. Uh, also, we can uh, when we are talking about fiber optic uh, uh, about fiber geometry mismatches, we are talking about uh, uh, changes in the core diameter, in the di uh, diameter of the cladding, uh, core ellipticity, core cladding concentricity differences. So all these different uh, uh, failure scenarios that are creating are creating loss of an optical signal as uh, the signal propagates along the fiber as shown uh, uh, visually on uh, this slide. So we see, for example, uh, uh, mismatch in the numerical ap aperture or certain issues with the concentricity. In other words, the glass core is not uh, properly center, uh, centered uh, uh, in the cladding. Or we also have, may have issues uh, 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 in regards to uh, ellipticity of the, of the glass core, where the, where the glass core uh, cross-section is not perfectly circular. Or we can also have a cladding this diameter mismatch where uh, two, uh, two uh, optical fibers that are supposed to have the same diameter of the cladding uh, don't have the same diameter of the cladding, which would also create certain losses in a, in a, in a, during the, during the uh, optical signal propagation along the fibers. So there's a, a pretty wide variety of different uh, failures uh, scenarios that are happening on a, during, the, during the manufacturing of of the uh, optical uh, fiber that may create this type of uh, losses that are uh, categorized uh, under a category of intrinsic loss. We're moving to the next section of uh, today's lecture. Uh, we are going to start discussing uh, measurements that are uh, performed in the area of fiber optic communications. <clears throat> There's a few slides here that cover uh, the testing in a more uh, generic sense, uh, including this slide. So first, let's talk a little bit about why test. So there's a few uh, few reasons why we are doing the test in uh, fiber optic communication. So obviously, uh, in many instances, we would like to verify the cable quality, uh, fiber optic cable quality before it's been installed. We have uh, uh, different, uh, uh, we may have different suppliers out there from which we will be ordering uh, fiber optic cables. Some of them may be uh, uh, offering or. or uh, shipping a higher quality cable. Some of them uh, uh, may have uh, uh, 
in producing a, a different uh, a level of quality of uh, optical fiber. So it's very important be, uh, before the optical fiber has been uh, installed to verify the cable quality and also to make sure that uh, uh, the loss per kilometer or loss per mile that's going to be used in, uh, in the budgeting of the fiber optic link is a, is a correct uh, number uh, based on the uh, specific fiber, fiber optical fiber that's going to be used in that specific link. Another reason uh, why we are doing the testing is to document a baseline for the system maintenance upgrades and troubleshooting so once a uh, fiber optic link is installed we want to uh, uh, kind of record uh, the performance of that fiber optic link so that later on if there's any issues uh, uh, during the operation uh, a few years later we want to uh, uh, we want to make sure that we are able to uh, have some sort of a reference uh, as to how the fiber optic link performed when it has been installed. And then another reason for uh, testing is uh, to establish accountability at various stages of installation. Uh, uh, different people uh, are involved at different uh, uh, levels, uh, at different uh, parts of the whole uh, uh, um, uh, process of installation. So it's very important to know who is responsible for what. Uh, and uh, testing can uh, uh, provide a very, uh, in, uh, very useful information in that regard. And finally, if uh, a certain uh, fiber optic link does not work properly, we would want to uh, do a, a certain um, uh, inspection of it to uh, uh, identify locations at which we may have certain issues. And a uh, test comes uh, as uh, very handy in that regard, especially OTDR measurement that we are going to be talking about uh, in a few minutes. When are we performing the test? Um, either by uh, um, at, at the point of uh, when the cables are received during the receiving inspection, uh, of course, obviously during the installation of a fiber optic cable, if we are doing a certain upgrade of a fiber optic network, and finally, if uh, we are performing the maintenance and troubleshooting of a faulty of a faulty uh, fiber optic link, what kind of uh, uh, what types of tests are required? is also listed here uh, on the right side. Uh, we may uh, perform an acceptance test. Uh, we may uh, uh, conduct an assembly link loss test. There's also an attenuation test, continuity test. Uh, uh, it's possible also to do end-to-end -end attenuation test, uh, cable characterization using OTDR. So it, there's a, a large variety of different types of tests at different levels and uh, at different uh, times that are being performed, that are being conducted during the, uh, during the uh, life of, a, of an optical uh, uh, fiber link from, uh, from, from its uh, uh, installation to uh, throughout the life, uh, to throughout the use, you know, uh, even, uh, you know, if, uh, you know, there are certain situations where uh, uh, certain uh, faults are happening, you know, uh, certain troubleshooting can occur uh, when uh, test is being, uh, 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 performed, etc. So, uh, really, a large variety of uh, tests that are available for fiber optic technicians to properly uh, uh, quantify the performance of a specific fiber optic link at uh, different at different times. What would be the benefits of uh, testing and uh, documenting the test? It assures uh, system quality. It protects contractors and end users uh, by establishing certain accountability. Uh, also, uh, a test would identify the problems in a quick and efficient way. And finally, uh, uh, it has a great impact on the cost that's associated with system uh, upgrades. Uh, so, uh, uh, very uh, different uh, aspects uh, that uh, a test uh, can, uh, can, uh, can impact uh, in, uh, the whole, um, in the whole uh, uh, process of uh, fiber optic installation, operation and maintenance and troubleshooting. There's a few uh, things that are important to remember uh, about uh, testing in general uh, sense. Uh, there's two important aspects that uh, have to be present uh, to for uh, for test to be uh, uh, to be successful, one is the test repeatability. So that every test, each test that uh, that's being performed uh, uh, or repeated, uh, regardless of who takes the measurement, uh, should have the same results uh, using the same tolerances. A certain level of confidence uh, in test has to uh, also be present. 
uh, it begins, begins with the calibration of all the test equipment that will be used uh, uh, for uh, quantitative measurements. So reliable and repeatable measurements are a very important factor of for uh, of proper training techniques and equipment maintenance if you if you as a fiber optic technician are responsible for testing you want to make sure that uh, uh, an engineer or your supervisor is fully confident in your in, in the test that you are performing because uh, the results of your test uh, will uh, have a great impact on uh, on uh, many aspects of, uh, of 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 the whole job uh, uh, if uh, a loss budget is being calculated uh, and uh, needs to be uh, confirmed on a, on, a, on a real live fiber optic link and there's certain non-conformances uh, uh, engineering or uh, your supervisor, supervisor wants to make sure that the non-conformance uh, does not stem from a faulty uh, test, fault, faulty measurements, but rather uh, has some real, uh, uh, real uh, uh, root causes that are creating non-conformance. So those, uh, those aspects are extremely important because uh, the level of accountability and uh, confidence in, uh, in the test measurements is, is very important uh, in, uh, in this uh, field as in any other field. What kind of me uh, measurement instruments are used in uh, fiber optic measurements is, uh, uh, is uh, uh, shown here on this slide. As already mentioned, there are different levels of uh, fiber optic testing. We may use visual fault locator or so-called VFL, uh, very often optical power meter with a light source in conjunction with light source is used for basic power loss measurements and finally a more comprehensive uh, measurement uh, using OTDR or so-called optical time domain, domain reflectometer is uh, a, a very popular type of measurement that's uh, that's being used by almost every uh, professional fiber optic technician uh, that is uh, uh, that is uh, uh, working in uh, in this field. Uh, on uh, this slide, on the right side, uh, uh, top right side uh, is uh, uh, an optical power meter shown. Uh, while on the bottom right corner you have uh, a, a specific example of an OTDR device that is being used to provide uh, to provide a more comprehensive picture of uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, more, more comprehensive snapshot of the performance of a specific fiber optic link. On the previous slide, uh, we uh, covered the test equipment that is being used during the fiber optic measurements. However, there is an important uh, test that is usually performed first and that's a visual test. This visual uh, test may look uh, too simplistic and not important uh, uh, at this point. However, it actually plays a very important role because uh, it does not cost a lot, it uh, does not take a lot of time and it can, uh, it can uh, provide a very important important insight that may uh, save a lot of time because uh, if uh, during the visual test certain uh, uh, faulty mechanisms are uh, discovered uh, there may be no need for any kind of more uh, comprehensive other test that uh, takes more time and uh, resources so in that regard visual test may uh, play an important role so a uh, visual test is, can be conducted by, conducted by simply uh, using your unaided eye to evaluate the cable plant, connectors, uh, cables, and uh, the component of the fiber optic link for any kind of discontinuity or, 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 or uh, damage. So physical discontinuities that we are talking about here may be excessive bands, nicks, cuts, abrasions, thin spots, wrinkles, burn marks, marks missing markings at labels. So all those uh, 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 visual uh, uh, indications may uh, provide a very, very important information uh, uh, that uh, can, be, uh, can be used in uh, troubleshooting, maintenance, etc. Uh, visual tests may reveal significant cable failures prior to purchase, pre-installation and post-installation. So if you have received uh, an, a fiber optic cable, you don't want to uh, right away jump and do a certain uh, measurement using test equipment, you actually want to do a visual inspection to make sure that you know uh, there is no any kind of visual damage. Uh, so this test is an easy test to perform, uh, but on the other side has a great value to the technician at all stages of operation. So that's the point, that's the takeaway of, uh, uh, from, from this, uh, from this uh, slide. It's very important to perform the visual test before you uh, resort to any kind of further uh, measurement using, uh, uh, um, using uh, test equipment uh, that's specific to the fiber optic communications. 
Another uh, simple test that uh, can be performed, usually after the visual uh, inspection, is a continuity check. Uh, continuity check uh, is uh, performed using a simple visual fault locator. An example of a visual fault locator is shown here on this slide. So we're talking about class 2 or class 3 laser that operates in the visual range. Uh, usually, it's a, we are dealing with a red laser operating at a, at a wavelengths of uh, around uh, 635 to 665 nanometers. So, what's basically uh, happening? How this test is performed? You are basically uh, uh, connecting visual fault locator uh, and uh, by uh, to the to, to one end of the optical fiber, and uh, by uh, coupling the visual fault locator uh, to an optical fiber and shooting the light. From, the, from this laser, uh, that light, since it's visible, it's going to show through the length of the fiber several miles or kilometers long if the fiber has a good continuity. In other words, there is no leaks uh, along the uh, cable. So again, visual fault locator will emit a bright red light upon exiting the fiber if there's continuity. So the red light is going to go from one side where you connected the visual fault locator all the way to the other side of the fiber optic, of the optical fiber as long as uh, the length of uh, an optical fiber will not uh, result in a loss that would, that would completely uh, kill the, 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 the light that's being prop propagated through the, through the optical fiber. If we uh, are dealing with a dim light uh, at, the, at the other end of the optical fiber, we can assume something is wrong because the, the dim light uh, may indicate several problems such as that fiber is shattered, uh, poorly made it, made it uh, bent excessively, or it's extremely dirty. Uh, so, uh, it's important to uh, understand that uh, this is a basic test. It does not necessarily mean that the fiber is operational at a particular wavelength uh, if uh, this uh, type of test is uh, successful. It's just an indication. It's like a basic, uh, you, you can even call it a sniff test, basic test that may, uh, that may uh, indicate certain issues uh, on the fiber, if uh, uh, the result, if, if the test uh, result, uh, 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 if the result of this test of the test uh, performed using visual fault locator is successful, it still does not mean that your that your optical fiber, that your fiber optic link, is uh, is a good and uh, is uh, um, uh, going to meet certain standards. So you have to perform further measurements. Uh, so, in, in a sense, uh, continuity check is just a test uh, that would, uh, in a quick and efficient way, uh, way uh, uh, point out certain issues on the uh, certain major issues on the uh, optical fiber. You may also perform continuity check using optical lead detector. Uh, this type of device works uh, uh, in a slightly different way than a visual fault locator, in the sense that it consists of two of two uh, test uh, uh, devices. We have uh, 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 a detector sniffer that's going to be connected on the receiving end of the uh, optical fiber. And then on the other side, on the transmitting side, we have a light source that's going to uh, serve as a signal generator. So you are basically shooting uh, an uh, invisible light, infrared light, at uh, around 1300 nanometers typically uh, from the power source. And that uh, light, that signal is going to uh, propagate along the optical fiber, would eventually illuminate an LED indicator on, a, on, the, de on the detector on the receiving side. And uh, that's how the infrared light is going to be detected. So this, uh, uh, this opera uh, the operation of this device is simple. Usually it's uh, battery operated uh, and uh, it's used to uh, determine if uh, there's any major issues on the, uh, on the, on the optical fiber that you are testing. Uh, so again, it, uh, the test is similar to the test performed using visual fault locator in the sense that we are uh, checking for continuity of the of the cable. The only difference that here we are dealing with an infrared light instead of red light, so the, the, the signal that you are sending through the optical fiber is not visible. And the second uh, uh, important difference is that you're using two pieces of equipment here, the power source on one side, on one end of the, of the optical fiber uh, that's under test, and then a detector uh, that uh, has an LED indicator on the, uh, on the uh, other uh, side, of the, on the other end of the uh, optical fiber that's under the test. The next level uh, test, uh, fiber optic test, fiber optic measurement is the test that uh, uh, is performed using so-called optical loss test set or OLTS. Uh, this type of, uh, of uh, 
test equipment consists of two two parts. One is the power source and then another one is a power meter. So uh, we are dealing with a uh, uh, test equipment that can uh, be used uh, on either a multi-mode or single mode uh, fibers with various modes and wavelength options. So uh, basically we are talking about we're talking about the power source that uh, sends a signal using uh, with, uh, that, that basically uh, is characterized by a stable reference power and then measuring the loss over the length uh, using uh, a power meter on the other side. So power loss uh, in this regard can be measured either in decibels or dBm or uh, watts, microwatts. So there's different, uh, different modes that, uh, uh, can be, uh, that can be set on these types of devices. So what you see on this slide on, uh, on the right side is basically uh, two, uh, two devices that we just described. So what you see on this uh, slide on the right side is uh, 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 two, uh, two uh, pieces of uh, uh, test equipment that, are, uh, um, that uh, are part of the OLTS uh, set. On the uh, uh, most right side, you have an optical source that's going to be uh, the source that it's going to be connected to one end of the optical fiber and uh, and it's going to be used to shoot the signal into the optical fiber uh, the signal is going to propagate along the optical fiber on the other side you're going to connect the power meter that's going to receive that signal and then it's going to compare the signal that's been received with the reference signal that's been sent from the optical source and establish certain ratio of the received power versus transmitted power and uh, uh, basically uh, uh, using those two pieces of information is going to uh, quantify the amount of loss that's present on the optical fiber. In order to uh, achieve repeatable results and uh, uh, proper measurements using uh, OLTS, it's required to use uh, a certain type of uh, uh, test cables. Uh, usually uh, so-called uh, MQJs or measurement quality jumpers are used. These types of uh, cables are specialty reference cables that are uh, pre-made uh, by uh, by manufacturer, they are labeled and serialized, and if you look at them, they look like any uh, jumper, but uh, they uh, have uh, to meet certain standards during the manufacture as far as uh, their uh, loss is concerned, etc. Uh, it's very important to uh, um, properly maintain uh, these types of uh, test cables because they can be quickly and permanently damaged by mating and demating if uh, the technician is uh, not uh, cautious and meticulous in, uh, uh, in cleaning and maintaining these types of uh, test cables. Th these types of test cables should always be used during the testing so that uh, uh, the losses uh, from the test equipment are minimized. If you're using some other type of uh, cables to connect your power source and the power meter to uh, your fiber optic uh, link that is under the test, you're running the risk of introducing certain loss to the to the test cables that you definitely don't want uh, to uh, introduce uh, in, uh, because uh, it may skew your uh, test results in a in an undesirable uh, direction. So always use. Uh, pre-made uh, test cables or so-called measurement quality jumpers that are made by uh, by certain manufacturers and can be can be uh, can be ordered to together with your test equipment together with your OLTS this slide briefly uh, puts in uh, perspective the loss budget that's an important uh, information for uh, uh, a fiber optic technician that performs the test uh, usually you have some sort of a reference line or uh, pass fail criteria that's established for uh, for uh, optical fiber that you're testing that are that's based on that are based on uh, the calculation of the loss budget uh, so uh, these calculations are based on the operating parameters of the light source and the receiver or so-called dynamic range and uh, usually a so-called maximum allowable loss uh, has been established and should be used during the uh, during the process of uh, calculation and testing we are talking about uh, a, a, fact, a factor of uh, we are talking about a quantity that takes into account all the losses that are uh, present along the optical uh, 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 optical fiber that would include the connector loss the cable loss and finally uh, the splice loss so uh, maximum allowable loss, loss is uh, that reference uh, guideline that, that would establish pass-fail criteria uh, during, the, during the test. How is, how is the uh, link attenuation allowance calculated is shown on this line on the bottom. If you look at the, at the box, 
on the bottom uh, left side that's the top level so the, the, the link allowance the uh, loss along the entire fiber optic link is going to consist of three factors the first one is the cable uh, attenuation the second is the loss uh, in the connectors that are present on the fiber optic link and finally the third factor would be a uh, loss present in the splices that uh, uh, exist on the fiber optic link each of these three uh, three uh, um, contributions is uh, uh, can also be calculated so if you're for example looking at the cable attenuation loss uh, it's shown in a box in the top box on the right side where you're basically multiplying the cable attenuation coefficients in the db per kilometer uh, uh, by the total length of the fiber optic link that's going to give you information about the total uh, loss total attenuation of the cable and then um, the second second uh, box in the middle on a, on a, on a, on the bottom uh, 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 on the bottom of the slide shows how to calculate the loss of the connectors so you basically have to uh, know uh, how many uh, connector pairs you have along the optical fiber and then you also need to know the cable loss allowance which uh, we already elaborated uh, it turns out to be 0.75 db max and finally uh, uh, losses uh, due to the uh, splices you also need to know the number of slices on the fiber optic link and you would multiply them by the splice loss that uh, uh, is usually a 0.3 dB number that's being used as a maximum splice loss allowed. Uh, so uh, certain calculations to be performed uh, most of time by engineering, but higher level fiber optic technicians should probably uh, know how to perform these calculations because they are an important aspect of the test as uh, again uh, here uh, certain pass fail criteria based on certain uh, uh, thresholds are established and uh, as a fiber optic technician who performs the test, you want to know whether your uh, optical fiber uh, that's under the test passed criteria or failed, and uh, this provides an important uh, uh, insight into, into that aspect of a fiber optic measurement. It's impor important to mention uh, when, uh, when we are talking about fiber optic measure measurements that there are certain standards out there that you have to abide to uh, uh, when, uh, when you're doing uh, fiber optic uh, uh, measurements. One, of, uh, an important, one important aspect is so-called end-to-end insertion loss reference uh, that needs to be established if you are doing measurements with, uh, with, uh, with uh, OLTS or a power, uh, power set. Uh, so basically there are a few methods here method A, method B, and method C, uh, without going too much in detail about how, how th these tests are performed, it's uh, important to understand that the reasoning behind is you want to uh, calibrate out any kind of uh, uh, impact of your test equipment. If you are dealing with a power meter and light source and certain test cables, those test cables after they are connected to your fiber optic link would uh, uh, eventually uh, impact the performance of the fiber optic link. So you're doing these multiple, mul multiple tests to kind of calibrate out uh, the impact of the test equipment and test cables that are present uh, during the test. This slide uh, goes further into the whole area of uh, uh, the whole uh, topic of end-to-end -end insertion loss reference. On this slide here, you see a cable plant that's uh, being under the test and also uh, identified uh, three methods, A, B, and C, that uh, we have also elaborated on the previous slide. And we can see that each of these methods would take into account the cable plus certain certain uh, piece of uh, test equipment. For example, method A is uh, taking into account the cable as well as one mated pair of the connectors. Uh, method B includes the loss of two mated pairs of the connectors plus cable. And finally, method C includes only loss of the cable plant. So method C is the method that uh, is the most accurate one as it does not take into account uh, any uh, any test equipment that is a part of the of the test. An important accessory the, that comes with the uh, with the test equipment used in fiber optic measurements are so-called fiber mandrels. So what we are talking about here, uh, fiber mandrels are these small uh, uh, plastic uh, holders where you would uh, wind uh, optical fiber for certain reasons. Uh, they are used to meet certain launch conditions specified in certain uh, test standards. What we are dealing with here is basically when you are uh, performing certain measurements. Uh, certain higher order modes exist that may skew your your uh, your measurement. So you want to uh, remove those higher order modes from uh, from uh, from the 
test measurement and these mandrels are serving that purpose so if you're doing this type of a uh, winding of the optical fiber uh, on these uh, plastic holded cold fiber mandrels uh, uh, they would act as a uh, mode filters in other words they would remove higher order modes from the optical signal and by doing that you're going to achieve equilibrium model distribution when testing with led sources that overfill the fiber so in certain instances uh, uh, if you again using uh, LED as a, as a sources, uh, you know that LED uh, would uh, uh, spread light. They would diverge. They may uh, overfill the fiber and uh, create certain higher order modes. So uh, using mandrels would uh, reduce the risk of uh, or uh, presence of those higher order modes that would uh, um, that, that 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 are creating certain issues during the during the measurements. Uh, so uh, as a as a, an implication of uh, the use of fiber ma uh, fiber mandrels they would uh, improve the measurement consistency and loss measurement repeatability because uh, uh, that's going to ultimately yield fewer false failures and that's why uh, use of uh, uh, this accessory is desirable and uh, as i said uh, this accessory is an important uh, uh, standard uh, standard accessory in uh, any kind of uh, OLTS or OTDR. And finally, last portion of this lecture uh, is covering the aspect of optical time domain reflectometer. This is an, a very important uh, piece of test equipment that is uh, that has gained a, a, a broad popularity in uh, fiber optic measurements as it provides a very comprehensive snapshot of what is going on on a, on a fiber optic link that's being tested. So we are talking about a piece of uh, equipment that operates like a radar in a sense that it sends the light to the fiber and then it measures the amount uh, of light that's being reflected from uh, different types of discontinuities uh, that uh, uh, indicate a certain uh, uh, a faulty uh, uh, points uh, along the along the fiber fiber it's important that uh, this piece of equipment uh, is a single piece of equipment. In other words, we are not using two pieces of equipment connected in, on one end of the fiber and on the other of the end of the fiber. Here we have just one single piece of equipment connected to, to uh, exclusively one side of the, of the optical fiber that's uh, under the test. Uh, Optical time domain reflectometer is uh, going to measure the intrinsic and extrinsic losses of the fiber, including the loss from the mated connector pairs, splices, excessive bands, etc. So what you uh, get as a result during the test is a map-like snapshot of what is occurring within the fiber being tested, which can be used as a troubleshooting aid by comparing the traces. So there is a fundamental difference between uh, OTDR, between optical time domain reflectometer, and uh, uh, power meters uh, described on the previous slide in the sense that here, not only that you are getting how much loss uh, occurs along the fiber, but also it, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, type of uh, uh, measurement device uh, clearly specifies the locations at which uh, certain loss occurs. So you can exactly know from the map-like snapshot that you're getting on the screen of this device, you can know exactly uh, whether, I don't know, one mile uh, from you, you have a certain loss that may look like a connector or uh, half a mile from uh, you on optical fiber, you may have a certain damage on the connector based on a, on a, on a certain uh, a feature that you see on the screen, etc. So that's basically a, a, a very comprehensive picture that you are getting that you are getting with a, with a, with optical time domain reflectometer in the sense that you uh, 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 that the device identifies uh, losses uh, as well as the location where, where the locations along the fiber where those losses occur. What you see on this slide is a uh, is a plot uh, uh, that uh, may have been taken from uh, from a screen of, of an OTDR. So uh, it's a uh, it's a plot where on the x-axis uh, uh, the distance in kilometers or miles is shown and then on the y-axis you have a relative power in dB. As you can see the curve is a downward sloping uh, uh, that uh, covers the aspect of a loss along the fiber and then uh, at certain at certain um, uh, point, points along the along the curve you have certain events uh, shown here as a b c d e uh, where uh, certain losses uh, occur uh, and based on the shape of, uh, of these events along the curve, you may identify whether you are dealing with a connector uh, loss or fusion splice or mechanical splice or end of a fiber. 
so for example if you have an upward peak such as in the case of, uh, of event B we are dealing with a connector loss as opposed to a, a downward drop uh, such as the event uh, uh, labeled here as C that would indicate the fusion splice so you can kind of exactly identify where uh, uh, at certain distance uh, away from you you have a certain type of a uh, loss or certain type of event be it a connector loss or splice loss or uh, uh, other types of uh, loss uh, that may occur along the fiber in order to properly uh, learn how to operate uh, OTDR it's a uh, important to mention uh, what uh, should what you can uh, set on a, on an OTDR there's a whole bunch of uh, settings that uh, uh, are given uh, at liberty of a, of a, of an, a fiber optic uh, technician to adjust such as the pulse width uh, uh, so, so what's basically happening again you're sending a pulse uh, from the OTDR that's, uh, that travels along the optical fiber and that, then that pulse is going to be reflected at certain discontinuities. So you can adjust the width of that pulse, you can adjust the wavelength range, uh, you also have uh, uh, flexibility to, uh, to uh, enter the index of refraction which is an important piece of information because that's how, how the, the device is going to uh, uh, quantify uh, uh, a distance uh, so what's be, uh, what, how, the, how the device measures again you know we're going back to the to that pulse that's being sent and then reflected after some time and then that time that uh, uh, that uh, uh, has passed from the from the point when you uh, when when you send the optical uh, pulse to the point when you receive the reflection that time is going to be turned into a uh, distance uh, based on the on on the uh, on the speed of light uh, and the speed of light we know is uh, uh, affected by uh, the uh, index of refraction of the material uh, which uh, in this case happens to be the the, uh, the index of refraction of the glass core through which the light propagates so index of refraction you need to know what is the index of refraction of the glass core used in the optical fiber that uh, is under the test so that you can uh, put this information because th uh, that information is going to be very critical uh, from the aspect of properly quantified the distance of uh, certain uh, events that are happening along uh, the optical fiber. Uh, so uh, there's few other things that uh, are important to uh, to uh, to uh, adjust uh, for a proper spatial resolution. So, for example, output part of the OTDR is adjusted by the selecting the the op output pulse width. Shorter fibers need less power. In such a case, you're using shorter output pulse and uh, the result of using shorter pulse is an increased resolution so you can see different parameters here that are playing against each other uh, and uh, for a specific application for a specific length of the of the optical fiber that's under the test you would want to adjust uh, some of these settings so that uh, you uh, end up with, a, with the most uh, optimized uh, type of uh, measurement uh, using this type of uh, equipment. An important aspect of uh, OTDR measurement is the concept of so-called dead zone uh, what's basically happening is uh, when you are shooting this pulse uh, using OTDR, uh, it, uh, the OTDR uh, as, a, as a device almost acts as, um, uh, as kind of getting blind to, uh, to a certain, to, for a short period of time. In other words, uh, when you send a pulse, there's a short period of time when uh, OTDR will not be able to, re uh, to receive any kind of reflection back uh, f uh, from, uh, from the, from the, from the uh, 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 cable uh, that's under the, under the test. So that's so-called dead zone. So it's almost like, uh, you know, you can, uh, you can uh, establish an analogy between using a, a shutter camera with a, with, a, with a flash. So if you take a, 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 a picture with a flash, uh, uh, pointing the flash directly into the eyes of a person, that person for a, for a sh short period of time is going to be blind, uh, going to get blind. Uh, so uh, you can establish certain analogy of uh, you know with, uh, with that uh, with that uh, event uh, and uh, uh, what's happening in uh, in your OTDR. So the bottom line is, at the moment when you uh, uh, from the, from the moment uh, when you send the pulse with the o opt, uh, with the OTDR on the on the fiber, there's a short period of time when, when your OTDR cannot receive any kind of reflection uh, a reflection. In, in a sense, you know, it gets blind. So it's very important to uh, establish. Uh, uh, to establish a certain, to, to mitigate the risk of this so-called dead zone. 
uh, and that dead zone is shown here in a in a gray, uh, and that it represents so-called recovery time of the detector uh, that is present on on a OTDR, similar to the recovery of a human eye from a camera flash. So the duration of the output pulse will determine the length of the dead zone. If the output pulse is 20 nanoseconds, the dead zone will be approximately two meters or six feet uh, away from the trace length. In other words, if you are sending the pulse using OTDR that's 20 nanoseconds long. Uh, uh, your OTDR will not be able to uh, to uh, to capture any kind of reflections, any kind of uh, of uh, failure mechanisms or discontinuities that are uh, two meters or six feet away six feet away uh, from uh, from the location where OTDR is uh, positioned. The way how to uh, eliminate the impact of a dead zone is uh, through the use of so-called uh, dead zone eliminators. Uh, that uh, are nothing else than a, a special type of uh, launch cables of a certain length. Uh, so in order to perform the OTDR test, you have to use different type of, uh, of, uh, of, um, of a test cable, of the launch cable. Uh, these cables are usually uh, typically 50 to 100 meters long, and they're attached at the front end of a link that will be uh, tested using OTDR. So these take cables, again, are known as dead zone eliminators or dead zone fibers, pulse suppressors and they're about 50 to 100 meters long so when you put them uh, they any kind of reflection that comes from them is uh, obviously not relevant since we are dealing with the test cable so in a sense you are pushing away the uh, cable under the test from the OTDR so that you give enough time to the uh, to the OTDR to recover uh, uh, during the dot z dead, dead zone uh, time so that any kind of reflection that comes from from the uh, from the cable under the test will uh, properly be captured by uh, by the OTDR. These are two other important aspects of uh, OTDR measurement, so-called power floor and the noise floor. Uh, we are uh, talking here about the range selection, uh, the total distance that's displayed on uh, on the uh, OTDR screen is a direct result of the range selected. Obviously, this depends on the length of the fiber optic. Uh, uh, a cable that's being under the test. Uh, if you are using a, a longer uh, a cable that's under the test, if the, the cable under the test is longer, you have to specify a longer range. Uh, and a rule of thumb is twice the distance of the fiber under the test. So if your uh, fiber under the test is, let's say, 250 meters long, then your, your range uh, on the OTDR should be uh, at least 500 meters long. Another important aspect is number of data points that you're going to use to uh, to uh, uh, pr present uh, the, the the events on uh, on the OTDR screen. There's a finite number of data points that can be uh, depicted by the OTDR. Typically, about 52,000 data points are displayed. If range selected represents 80 kilometers, then uh, 52,000 data points are stretched across that range, which obviously affects the resolution. So the uh, longer the range you are measuring, uh, you have a larger spread of uh, data points which would ultimately uh, negatively impact the resolution uh, of the uh, measurement that you see on the screen of, uh, of the OTDR. We have already elaborated uh, the importance of uh, setting the index of refraction. Again, once more to, uh, to uh, review, we said that uh, OTDR operates as a radar in the sense that it sends the pulse along the optical fiber and then it waits for any kind of reflection uh, that may occur due to certain discontinuities that uh, exist along the uh, along the optical fiber. So the discontinuities such as uh, connector, connectors, uh, splices or any kind of uh, damages along the cable almost act as a as a target in the case of a radar that would uh, reflect the, uh, the, the pulse uh, back uh, towards the OTDR. Uh, so what the OTDR basically does is it measures the time that uh, uh, is going to pass between the moment when the pulse has been sent and the moment when the reflection has been received and that time is then turned into a specific distance based on the speed of the light along the optical fiber. We also know that the speed of light along the optical fiber is directly uh, affected by the index of reflection of the, uh, of the material through which the light propagates. In this case, we are, talk, uh, we, are con uh, we are we are dealing with a glass core of the optical fiber that has a certain index of refraction. So that index of refraction uh, 
is a very important piece of information for a proper uh, uh, translation of the time into the distance. Uh, that you have to uh, that you have to uh, enter into your optical uh, into your OTDR. So you uh, need to know what is the index of refraction of the glass core of the optical fiber that's being tested, and that piece of information is to be entered into the OTDR for a proper uh, quantification of the uh, of the of the distance uh, uh, at which uh, discontinuities or uh, or reflections occur. Another important. Uh, a, a parameter is so-called back stat scatter coef coefficient. Here we are talking uh, about uh, a parameter that defines the sensitivity of the detector in the OTDR that is going to uh, capture uh, reflections coming back from uh, the optical fiber under the test. If uh, this coefficient is uh, too, uh, uh, too uh, uh, sen uh, uh, adjusted to uh, uh, increase the sensitivity of uh, of the OTDR, in other words, if uh, too sensitive, the backscatter power level will be so great that the power floor cannot be seen from the reflective events. And if not sensitive enough, the display may not show may show a noise floor after the uh, after the output pulse. So all this is going to affect the resolution uh, or events that you are going to be uh, receiving on the screen. So it's very important to get familiar with the particular uh, OTDR that uh, you're going to be operating on uh, uh, and uh, uh, familiarization will uh, help you select the correct level of backscatter encryption that's going to res uh, uh, result in the most optimized uh, screenshot of the events that are happening uh, on the on the optical fiber that you are testing, and finally a little bit more terminology related to the uh, to the to the measurement uh, using OTDR measurement events uh, that uh, occur during the OTDR measurements can be uh, selected as reflective or non-reflective. If uh, the case of a reflective event, we are dealing with a pulse uh, type of a response on a, on a screen of the OTDR. Uh, that's caused by the air gaps uh, that, uh, for example, exist between the connector and phase uh, due to poor polishing or dirt. Uh, it can also be caused by mechanical splices, fiber ends, etc. On the other side, a non-reflective uh, event is going to be uh, 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 displayed as a, as a sudden decrease in the reflected power uh, that can be caused by um, um, splices or excessive bands, etc. So, uh, bottom line, uh, uh, there's uh, there's two specific events that can occur on a on a on a plot uh, uh, of the of the performance of your uh, of your fib uh, fiber optic uh, opt optical fiber uh, that can uh, 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 come on the screen as a pulse or reflective event or a sudden drop of the power. Uh, or so-called non-reflective event that's been shown uh, visually on this specific slide. We're coming to the end of the lecture 7 that uh, uh, covered the aspect of fiber optic measurements. Uh, as a quick uh, uh, wrap up, we talked about different types of uh, uh, measurements that can be uh, performed on uh, uh, optical uh, fiber links. We have covered uh, the testing from a more of a theoretical point of view, the reasoning why it's being performed, when it's been performed, why are uh, fiber optic uh, measurements important. And then uh, we went uh, and uh, described different types of uh, test equipment that uh, that's uh, used in uh, fiber optic measurements, starting with the visual fault locator and going all the way to, uh, to optical time domain ref reflectometer. Obviously, different uh, uh, types of uh, test equipment, different uh, uh, types of uh, test equipment are used at different levels of, uh, of uh, fiber optic uh, testing uh, for specific applications. We have also covered uh, briefly the concept of, uh, of, uh, of a loss and, uh, and the loss budget. Uh, that's an important uh, uh, piece of information that uh, gives important piece of information to the fiber optic technician who is performing the tests uh, uh, in, from, the, from the aspect of establishing pass and fail criteria uh, on, uh, on, the, on the fiber under the test. So uh, an important uh, uh, lecture, fiber optic measurements are an important aspect of a, of a job of a fiber optic technician. So. Uh, 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 
technician does not only uh, perform uh, the installation of the fiber optic link and fiber optic equipment, but also performs the test, test be it the test immediately after the installation or troubleshooting uh, or maintenance of uh, optical fiber. So it's very important to uh, be familiar with uh, the way how uh, fiber optic uh, measurements are performed and what kind of equipment are, uh, equipment are is used. Uh, so this lecture is an important lecture to uh, be uh, properly studied and understood uh, from the aspect of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of a fiber optic technician who's going to be performing these types of uh, uh, activities uh, uh, on, a, on a job site. With this, uh, I will conclude lecture number seven. Uh, I hope you enjoy this lecture and I will see you next time.